Hello, everyone. Oh, that's not good. That looks glitchy AF. Why is that happening? I'm going to need that today. All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. One sec. Gosh, I'm pale. I can't wait till the winter's over and I can get outside more, y'all. Every wrestling season, I'm just so pale because I'm just inside. I'm researching all day, doing homework all day, uh, streaming all day, reading all day, and then go to wrestling and then come home and fall asleep. I'm just not outside enough. Um, here, maybe I can make myself look better with the lighting. I got to hope so. How is the sound? How is the stream quality? How's everything? How are you? How is everyone in the chat? Where's my other freaking light? Oh, well. Oh, there it is. How is everyone? I'm doing great. I just read all morning. Didn't have, like, homework or anything to do. Last week was so busy. So busy. Had two wrestling competitions. It took all my time. All right, let's see. Is Midwestern Marks a base Lysenkoist? Not yet. Um, not yet. Maybe not. Oh, my head got tipped over. My cutout of my own face. I didn't realize it fell over. Um... <laughs> But I've been so curious about the Lysenko thing forever, right? Because obviously Western academia dismisses Lysenko. And if you look at his Wikipedia page, it calls him a pseudoscientist and stuff. But um, that's what, you know, that's how they treat um, everything that came out of the Soviet Union. Everything that came out of the Soviet Union is bad and evil and wrong. And they just weren't weren't as smart as us Westerners. So they made all these mistakes and I uh, just believed everything that came out of Marx and Lenin and Stalin's mouth. And so I've been wanting to, you know, take the time to do the research myself for a while. Um, so today I started, right? So today I started that research and I'm going to tell you all um, from my preliminary research what conclusions I've drawn, which aren't, you know, I'm not going to call myself a Lysenkoist. I'm not going to call myself a Morganist or a Dar Neo-Darwinist or a Mendelian geneticist. I'm not a geneticist, geneticist at all, right? This is the first time I've researched biology and genetics since high school, <laughs> right? But there are some very interesting things that I found in doing that research. And that's what I want to share with everyone and then get y'all's opinions. Um, hey, I won't be here long, but I'll hang as long as possible. Loved your last vid with second thought. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, so today, sorry, let me just finish setting up my setup here. All right, now we got the garbage can out of the way. So today I um, read a handful of popular papers about Lysenko, some more favorable and some not. Listen to um, the infrared stuff on Lysenko or some of it. Um, so audio and video are great. Fantastic. Hey, everybody. Hey, Where, Where Pilgrim, how are you? Sound is great. Good. Shout out to my parents for the new microphone that they gave me for Christmas. <laughs> Maybe my parents are based Lysenkoists. I beat Jenny Lynn here. Congratulations. That's rare. Yo, missed you, Eddie. Missed you too, Momo. How's it going? Thoughts on the DPRK? I got so many videos on the DPRK. Everybody, everybody knows I love my brothers and sisters in the North. In a video on Mao, you state that the Cultural Revolution was undialectical. As a Maoist, I'd love to hear an ML perspective on it. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Some of the things I've said in the past about the Cultural Revolution were kind of dumb. Um, 
Yeah, I might I I want to give a perspective on that, but I feel like it'll take forever if I do. Like I was saying it's undialectical cuz you know, base and superstructure as the base evolves and changes, the superstructure should change along with it. Right? So there's no need to manipulate the superstructure, but you know, of course we need to manipulate the superstructure in some ways. Like we need to wage the ideological struggle against wrong bourgeois ideas. You know, we need to educate people on socialist ideology, um, move people away from individualism. And yes, these things will happen as the material base changes. But if you're trying to combat counter-revolution and capitalist reactionaries within your own country, as well as, you know, the effects of imperialism, capitalist imperialism externally, you know, there might be a need to um, also change the superstructure in a lot of ways, attack these various aspects of the superstructure, which is, you know, what the Cultural Revolution did. And now, you know, in China, it's considered a mistake, even among Marxists. But it's like, would China still be around today? Would they still be socialist today if the Cultural Revolution didn't happen? I don't know um so i'm i'm still split on it but how's the work on the propaganda pipeline it's going well you're right now you're you're in the propaganda pipeline so um let's get into this lysenko talk because i'm so um interested in, in bringing up this discussion like some people are afraid to talk about lysenko because they're going to be called a conspiracy theorist or whatever it's like y'all everything is up for debate, right? Everything is up for discussion. If some things aren't up for debate, they aren't up for discussion. They're just conspiracy theories. Like then what do you, it's like, what are you trying to hide? Right. By saying that this is a conspiracy theory and we can't talk about this because if it's wrong, right. If the ideas are false, then we, you should be able to prove that they're false, right? You should be able to engage with them on their merits. Um, debate has you effing pussy. <laughs> What? Why do people always say that? What am I even supposed to debate Haas on? Like 99% of this video is going to be like me agreeing with Haas. Spoiler alert. Um, but I don't know what y'all want me to debate him on. But um, maybe just just calm down with your calling people a pussy before I break you in half and listen to what <laughs> listen to what I'm going to say about Lysenko with an open mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> and future reference, if you see someone with these ears in real life, don't call them that. It's going to be a bad decision for you. Um, so my earliest, like my first initial thoughts, um, these have always kind of been my thoughts when looking into Lysenko just on a, on a base level. Like capitalism is such a fetter on science. Capitalism is such a fetter on science. The bourgeois, you know, economic and um, the econ bourgeois economic system and the superstructure, the, you know, culture and academy and politics that stems from it really, really hold back scientific progress, scientific discussion and debate, um, hold back the um, pursuing and research into new ideas that may challenge, you know, pro-capitalist ideas or ideas that are accepted in the West or ideas like Lysenko's that have, you know, been dismissed by Western biologists um, that originated in the Soviet Union. Um, and we had a tweet about this the other day um, that I thought was pretty good, or Carlos did said, under capitalism, this is William Z. Foster, by the way, under capitalism, science is a slave to the class interests of the bourgeoisie. Thus, biology justifies the mad class struggle in war. Economics puts on an unqualified blessing upon wage slavery. History proves that capitalism is society perfected. Psychology explains away poverty on the basis of inferior beings, etc. Capitalist science is also a veritable fortress of metaphysical concepts of every kind. But socialism strikes all these fetters from science. The working class exploits no subject class. Therefore, it has no interest to degrade science into a subtle system of propaganda. But on the contrary, to give it the freest possible development, Marxian dialectical materialism destroys the metaphysics that paralyzes bourgeois science. William Z. Foster in, in Towards the Soviet America. Um, 
So the class interests of the bourgeoisie often lead them to suppress scientific advancement um, and scientific investigation. And, and as I was researching genetics um, and, and, you know, the evolution of uh, genetic and biological sciences, I found that it's the opposite of what you usually hear in the West. You know, there were far more British and American and Australian geneticists and scientists who were suppressed or were, who, or were killed or were silenced um, than there were in the Soviet Union, you know, where you had these different schools of thought in genetics who were constantly debating these things um, and, and constantly presenting new research to the public, which would be published, you know, so people could read it and, and make a decision for themselves. Um, so for a great example of, you know, bourgeois science, just look at the Wikipedia page about Lysenkoism, right? And this is why I knew I needed to eventually do my own research on Lysenko, um, cause this is his, uh, Wikipedia page is so ridiculous. Dismisses him as a pseudoscience says more than 3,000 mainstream biologists were dismissed and imprisoned in the Soviet Union. They were executed. You know, anybody who went against Lysenko was suppressed and killed, even though, you know, there were open opponents of Lysenko um, well before he, he stepped up on the stage and after, you know, and these ideas were debated all the way through. Um, and there were, you know, there were tons of geneticists being suppressed in, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, after World War I, I believe, for World War II, there weren't any, like, um, geneticists left in the UK um, doing, doing more research. And there was no money and um, resources even being invested in that research anymore. Um, but, yeah, just dismisses him as ridiculous says he supported Joseph Stalin. Um, they were best buddies. Um, and there's one part, I don't know if you keep reading this, basically what they say is that Lysenko was wrong because he tried to fit genetics um, and genetic science and evolutionary science, evolutionary biology, studying how species evolve and change into dialectical materialism, the dogma of dialectical materialism. Right. So we read Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism and then just tried to fit genetic science into this little box. Um, and, and that's why he was wrong. And after hearing that, you know, a red flag should go up for anybody who understands what dialectical materialism is. Right. Anybody who knows what it is should be like, well, that doesn't really make sense because dialectical materialism isn't a dogma. Right. It's it's not a dogma at all. So, you know, if dialectical materialism were being adhered to and Lysenko was wrong about something, dialectical materialism says that it should be investigated. Right. And that whatever he's wrong about should be criticized um, and all these theories should be publicly debated. Right. There is no dogma of dialectical materialism for him to fit genetic science into, um, you know, it's dialectical materialism itself is a scientific theory of the development of uh, human societies, which is what British Indian geneticist J.B.S. Haldane points out in this. You know, he doesn't say too much about in defense of Lysenko in this, um, but he says that the Western accusations against Lysenko don't make any sense, right? Because dialectical materialism states if Lysenko was wrong, what he was wrong about should have been called out and debated and discussed. And then they should have, you know, pursued more research to find what the truth actually is. That's dialectical materialism. You know, so a lot of the Western claims about Lysenko that are just used to die or Lysenkoism that are just used to dismiss it on its face, um, uh, don't make any sense in themselves, which is, you know, Carlos talks about this with his analysis of the purity fetish. This is what Western academia always does with the Soviets, right? They don't engage with the scholarship. They don't engage with the substance. They say the Soviet Union killed 800 million people, including all geneticists. Um, and Lysenko went along with it. And that's why we should just ignore everything that ever came out of the Soviet Union. Um, and they just weren't as smart as us, you know. Um, so they, they fell into all these silly, silly ideas. <clears throat> when in fact, you know, the Western claim that they're using to dismiss Lysenko doesn't make any sense. 
Um, so Haldane points that out as well as pointing out, you know, the mass censorship um, that was going on in the West, in the UK, in Australia, in, um, in the US of geneticists and the suppression of the debate. And he fleshes out what the debate was within the Soviet Union, which was extremely rich. And you had all these different schools of thought you know, in these schools of thought that that took into account, you know, what had already been established by Western scientists and Western geneticists, um, where, you know, that science was being politically suppressed and stopped from evolving. Um, but in the Soviet Union, they were, you know, questioning, you know, whether the, the um, conclusions of Western geneticists were correct, you know, taking what they thought was correct and trying to expand on it. Um, and not only that, but of course, the Soviet Union was feeding and educating and training up all these new people, all these peasants and workers who previously had no access to education or, you know, had no option of becoming scientists. Um, so it would eventually lead to a, a flourishing uh, of knowledge is what Haldane argues in this. Um, he ended up not supporting the Soviet Union anymore after, after Khrushchev, but um, that was still an interesting article and one that was good for, I liked reading it because it really summed up like my initial thoughts um, about the Western ideas um, about Lysenko. So the main question that Lysenko is trying to answer and that, you know, evolutionary biology is trying to answer um, is what role does the environment play in evolution and how are um, traits and genes passed down um, and then how does that lead to s different species evolving, right? How do species change qualitatively? You know, what's the difference between one species and another? And then how do these different species emerge over time? Um, so you had uh, Mendel, the most famous biologist who you probably learned about in your freshman year of high school um, in biology class and this other um, evolutionary biologist or geneticist or whatever you want to call him called Morgan or named Morgan. Um, now I can't think of their first names. I've read too much this morning. Um, <laughs> but they basically said that uh, genetic mutation happens by accident, right? They looked at how um, there can be, or I mean, change of species and evolution happens by accident. They looked at how um, there can be mutations within a species genes, right? And then they said they pass those mutations on to their, their children, the next generation or, you know, whatever um, they're reproducing, whether this be plants um, or, or animals or whatever. But Mendel was mostly looking at plants. He was doing experiments in the garden um, at the, the monastery that he was at or whatever it's called, um, wherever priests hang out <laughs> was where he was doing his research. So then the next uh, evolution on that, you have Darwin um, that says environmental stimuli, you know, based on the, or environmental stimuli cause species to change or no, that wouldn't be right. Sorry. He accepted the idea that genes mutate and change, right? And then he said the mutations, the, the changes that happen randomly within a species that are most well suited to survive in the environment of that species are going to flourish because then the, you know, the um, animals who have that mutation that makes them better suited for survival um, are going to be able to re reproduce more, repopulate more, and they're going to be able to thrive compared to um, species or, or animals that don't have that or plants that don't have that. Um, so it's based on survival and it's based on environment, but it's still random, right? Um, then you have Lamarckism, which is largely what Lysenkoism is based upon, um, which says organisms themselves can adapt and change due to external stimuli. So what I originally said about Darwin, but then said, no, 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 that's not right. That's not quite what Darwin said. Lamarckism is basically that. It's that external stimuli um, can change. I mean, uh, species can change based on external stimuli, you know, based on um, what would allow them to survive and thrive. And then they can pass those changes down to the next generation, to their children. Right. So it's not just random genetic mutation that happens to be better suited to an environment. Um, but in fact, the, the subject, the species is changing um, due to the environment in real time. You know, the living organism is, can change and then pass that change down to the offspring. 
Um, so Lysenko took a lot of these ideas when the famines were going on in Ukraine. Um, and he was asking, you know, how can the environment be altered in order to grow more food, not only quantitatively growing, you know, more amounts of food, but also how can we change species by altering the environment um, qualitatively? You know, how do we change the species itself by altering the environment? Um, so like, for example, growing winter crops in the summer, right? How do we take a seed that would normally only grow in the winter and alter its environment or chemicals or whatever um, so that we can grow it in the summer? And, you know, he had very practical reasons for asking this because, like I said, you had the situation going on in Ukraine um, with the famines. So now, you know, what the West qu claims, you know, which is based on the false claims of far right Ukrainian nationalists back in the day, um, is that the people in Ukraine were starved on purpose, right? Stalin starved these people on purpose because he was so evil. Stalin was just so evil. He hated Ukrainians so much that he took a giant spoon and he just ate all the food so that there was no food left for anybody else. Um, which we know that the Holodomor is BS. The famine was based on natural causes and the kulaks hoarding of grain. Um, and Stalin did everything he could to try and feed those people. Um, and this is another example, right? Lysenko was trying to figure out um, how do we use what we know about um, evolutionary biology and genetics in order to feed people. And that's why he was stationed eventually in Odessa. Um, so he could study these things directly and try and feed people. So when you read about Lysenko and what he was doing in Western, you know, biased bourgeois sources, it's it's so distorted, right? It's based on this idea that they were like purposefully trying to starve people um, or they don't even recognize that there was an effort here to feed people. Um, and it really distorts what Lysenko was saying and what his ideas actually were. And it forces you to pick through a bunch of bullshit if you want to get to the actual core of what his theories are. Um, and what his research and experiments um, resulted in and, and were so that you can actually make a judgment on, on what you think of it, right? Because they don't want you to actually do that. They don't want you to actually read it and make a judgment. They just want you to dismiss everything that came out of the Soviet Union as evil. Um, so, and I'm going to read the chat, chat soon. Uh, reminder for the chat, Today was my first day researching this stuff. So I, I gave a disclaimer at the start of this rant. Um, if some of you are just joining us in the middle of my Lysenko talk, I'm not um, an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a geneticist. This is the first time I've looked at, you know, evolutionary biology since like high school. Um, but I've been fascinated in the Lysenko thing. So I started doing research today. And these are the conclusions from my preliminary research, which is not that I'm a Lysenkoist. Right. I don't know what I am. Um, I have to do a lot more reading and now I'm super interested. I'm probably going to read this stuff tomorrow if I have time, um, but I'm not making any conclusions one way or the other. Right. I'm just stating what I found today and what I think of the things that I found today um, and stating how crappy the bourgeois Western Academy is, because if it wasn't, these ideas would be debated in public. Right. They wouldn't be dismissed as conspiracy theories and thrown under the rug. Um, there's, there's so many articles, like one of the articles I read from a Western evolutionary biologist in the seventies today, I had to stop. I had to put it away. Cause I'm like, I'm not even learning anything from this, right? They just make claims about Lysenko. Like, oh, he was just trying to fit his theory into whatever Stalin wanted. And there's no evidence, not even a citation, right? And it's like Lysenko did this and thought this, and it was, it's all these negative things about him. No citation, no evidence whatsoever. So it's like, you know, you're just making abstract claims that are, you know, accepted as truth in the Western Academy and the bourgeois Academy. Um, so you feel like you don't have to back them up, but then there's no evidence behind them because you feel like everyone's just going to accept these ideas um, about Soviet Union evil, Soviet scientists evil. So last thing I'll talk about in relation to this. A new study came out and Haas of Infrared tweeted this and said Lysenko was right which was interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear people's take on that. But there was a new study in Israel at the University of Haifa, Haifa. I don't know how to say that. I don't speak Hebrew. Um, but this, this study challenged neo-Darwinism. It challenged the accepted genetic and evolutionary biology or the, the science of evolutionary biology in the, in the West. Because um, they found that genetic mutations in humans may not be random, 
right? There's a vast amount of evidence that they collected that said, in fact, people may, or, you know, species may be adapting to their external stimuli in a way that allows them to survive better and thrive, and then passing on those changes to their children, very similar to Lamarckism or Lysenkoism. Um, so the study is really interesting. Hold on, let me move my notes about the study over here. Um, so basically they found that there um, was a malaria resistant mutation. So a lot of people were developing this genetic mutation that made them resistant to malaria um, in African communities where it was needed the most, you know, where malaria is most common. Um, and this can't be explained by neo-Darwinist theories because if Darwin was correct, the mutation wouldn't only be isolated to these communities in Africa where malaria is really common, right? If, if neo-Darwinists or Darwin were 100% correct, then this mutation, this uh, malaria-resistant mutation would have spread ac all across Africa randomly, you know, and all across Europe by now um, because it, it helps people um, survive generally and help species thrive. But it's not like that. It seems that these specific communities and people in these communities um, have adapted to be malaria resistant. Their genes have adapted, um, but they haven't it hasn't spread, you know, the way that that you would expect it to from a Darwinist perspective. Um, so then this begs the question, was Lysenko correct um, or is Lamarckism correct? Um, so not only did they look at malaria at Haifa University. Um, am I sure? Do I have the study up on screen? Okay, good, good, good. Um, they collected a vast amount of data about um, genetic mutations. Um, and not only genetic mutations, but the environment in which these genetic mutations are coming about. And what the evidence seems to suggest is that it's not random at all, um, but that genomes. Uh, but the genome collects a bunch of complex information, accumulates complex information, which can respond to the environment around it and then passes that down genetically. So, you know, there's this specific community um, where there's a lot of malaria. The people in that community start to get this genetic mutation that helps them resist malaria, helps them survive. They pass that down to their children, but it remains within that community where malaria is prevalent because in their environment, malaria is prevalent, you know, but the genetic mutation doesn't seem to be coming about in, um, in places where malaria isn't as prevalent, even within Africa, you know, the main place where you see malaria, it's only in these concentrated spots um, where malaria is hyper prevalent. So this new study and some other studies I've seen seem to challenge the neo-Darwinist theory seem to challenge the accepted Western beliefs, the bourgeois academy's beliefs about um, evolutionary biology um, and genetics, and, you know, seems to confirm that Lysenkoism or Lamarckism or some form of them uh, was more correct than we previously thought, you know, and that the genome can, in fact, adapt to its, its environment almost in real time, which is pretty freaking incredible. Um, and... Yeah, the very dialectical materialist idea too, the idea that the material base, the the material environment, you know, in real time changes the um, the genome and changes the the species, the subject living in that environment, um, which you know Darwin's theory does as well. Uh, but the idea that this isn't random, right? That the genome itself, you know, accumulates a complex of information and, and adapts to survive better um, would be a huge breakthrough. Um, or, or, you know, there'd be a lot of implications for that if it was, you know, proven without a shadow of a doubt to be true. So that's all I got for now. That's where I'm at currently. My research shall continue. Like I said, hopefully tomorrow I'm deep into this now, right? I've been wanting to dive deep into it forever. And today I finally got a chance. Um, so expect more talk about this stuff. Let's see what Tom McIntyre says. Hola, Eddie. Another great stream. Humility is the first step in learning. I'm reading what is to be done again. <laughs> Lots to take in and understand. Absolutely, Tom. Thank you so much for the super chat from New Zealand. Um, love that we got comrades all around the world supporting the stream. Um, 
glad you're reading what is to be done. Very important text, re very relevant text. Um, you know, one of those texts, like if people ask me, what do I start with? What should I read first? What is to be done would be towards the top of the list because it gives you a plan of action. You know, what do, what do we do going forward to organize for socialism? So anything by Lenin's great, of course. Um, another great stream, humility is the first step in learning. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought that up too because, yeah, I'm not saying I know what's going on. I'm not saying I'm super immersed in the field of evolutionary biology. I'm not saying I'm a Lys Lysenko was correct, Lamarck was correct, Mendel was correct, Darwin was correct, the neo-Darwinists were correct. I don't know yet, right? What I do know is that the Western Academy, the bourgeois academy that I've been in for the last six, seven years is extremely biased. You know, it's prone to suppress information and treat uh, existing socialist countries like they're evil and nothing that ever came out of them was correct or true or smart. Um, and, you know, that this has an effect on how we view people like Lysenko, you know, and then I can also read these studies, read what Lysenko actually said versus what went Mendel or Morgan or whoever else said. Um, and, and I can analyze what I think of their claims for now with the understanding that I'm at a very early, you know, stage of understanding these things on the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, and that there's still a vast amount of information that I need to go over and analyze critically before I can come to any serious conclusions about this, um, which is, you know, the, the stance that I would tell everyone to take, because what you don't want to do is end up working backwards from your conclusions, right? Um, so... No investigation, no right to speak. One of my favorite quotes. Absolutely. You should, should capture some test subject squirrels. <laughs> Bet. Oh, yeah, that's what I should start doing. I, I need to stop reading all this research from the ev evolutionary biologists and geneticists and just do my own, right? Just capture a bunch of squirrels and start doing my own tests. Try, I'm going to try and turn them into like Pokemon. Right? I'm going to be breeding squirrels like, come on, Pikachu, Pikachu, Pikachu. <laughs> Gradually developing a malaria resistance for your life and somehow passing it to your offspring would be Lamarckian. Um, sorry, let me. I should probably start um, a little bit higher. Um, up in the chat. Minnesota gang. Oh, the Vikings lost. Let's see here. Um, I was not expecting a biology lesson today, but I love it <laughs> for sure. I mean, I'll, I tried to give you a lesson. Um, I gave you a lesson on the stuff that I happen to read. Um, so let's see here. Let's see here. Cheer one. Yay. Thank you. Can you give a little background on Lysenko? Um, hope, hopefully I did that later on when I was talking. But like I said, he was um, there was this debate in the Soviet Union between people who accepted Mendel and, you know, the Western ideas of genetics that existed. Um, and then people like the Lamarckists, the, you know, people who accepted Lamarckism, the work of Lamarck and, and you know, criticized Mendel um, and had this idea that environmental stimuli could um, change the species. And then Lysenko was able to take a seed, and this is the example I gave, he was, took a seed that was normally grown in uh, the winter um, and change its environment. And he was able to grow it in the summer. And then he tried to mass produce this on a vast scale um, with varied results based on, you know, what kind of sources you're reading and the bias of those sources, honestly, if you're in the West. Um, but then he, he um, was then stationed in Odessa and his main goal, you know, he wasn't in a laboratory doing, doing research, you know, like a traditional scientist. He was trying to figure out how to feed people. Right, how to quantitatively increase the amount of food and qualitatively change um, different plant species so that more food could be grown year round um, and end the famines that had been happening in Ukraine. Um, and he was fr uh, from a peasant lineage. Um, you know, there was this thing published about him in Pravda, uh, the Soviet newspaper, um, about him being like a barefoot scientist because he was out barefoot working in the fields trying to figure these things out you know, contrasting him to a scientist that you'd find in a lab. So. Bro, Eddie, you can't do that. Whipping out guns is banned on Twitch and YouTube. Sorry. 
being conspiratorial has an overly negative connotation. True. Sometimes you're just critical and people call you conspiratorial. Watching a stream because I live in Romania. Wow. Greetings from Romania. I just want to say how much I appreciate what you guys are doing on YouTube. Solidarity. Yes. Solidarity, comrade, and all the comrades in, La in Romania. Heart Lysenko. He seems like whatever you think of Lysenko, um, there's the way he's portrayed in the West is wrong, right? The people who say exonerate Lysenko, you know, so long as they don't mean just accept everything he said is true and fact, you know, because he did have a cult of personality in the Soviet Union after a while. And like, you know, I'm sure some of the things he said or some of his research methods could have been wrong. Um, uh, I'll find out more as I look into it. And that one article I pulled up from Hardane, I believe was the guy's name. What's the guy's name? Haldane, sorry, Haldane, the British Indian um, geneticist. Uh, um, his, he had some critiques of Lysenko in that. You know, I just don't know what I think of them yet because I got to look into them myself um, before I just accept them. But yeah, it's an objective truth waiting to be discovered. Yes. And capitalism is a fetter on us discovering that truth. Capitalism suppresses and prevents research um into into the world around us um didn't marx and Engels write something about darwin's theory of evolution fitting dialectical materialism um, which would fit with lysenko's theory for sure they they took a lot of inspiration from from darwin i mean they marx and especially Engels. Uh, well i should say both but um Engels was really really into science marx um had a better grasp on math um, and also had a good grasp on science and evolutionary biology and uh, anthropology. Um, but Engels, that was kind of his specialty, uh, which is why he wrote like Dialectics of Nature. Um, but in Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State, which I need to finish my reading breakdown for, um, he talks about Darwin a lot, right? And talks about the breakthroughs of Darwin, um, how those had evolved and changed since Darwin, where they were at, you know, and how they fit within dialectical and historical materialism. Um, another person they draw from a lot is Lewis Henry Morgan, who basically applied Darwin's theory to anthropology, right? Which was basically saying we have to look historically, right? And, and look at how things have changed historically if we want to understand how they exist today. In an anthropology, that can mean the family form, you know, different aspects about society, culture, whatever else, um, which is another point that J.B.S. Haldane makes in his um, article we pulled up earlier, which is pretty good. I would recommend that's the one you should read if you want to get an intro to Lysenko, um, if you live in the West, at least. Um, but he says that the Soviet evolutionary biologists and um, geneticists put way more emphasis on studying history, right? And looking at historical development and how things changed and developed over time than the Western, um, the Western geneticists who were more focused on experiments, you know, just looking at things in isolation in the present, which is, you know, the idealist metaphysical worldview as Marx and Engels would call it not looking at things in their interconnection, not looking at things in their historical development, but isolated. Um, Soviets did a much better job of looking at the historical development of these things. And what do you think about Friedrich Hayek? He's a bourgeois moron. Um, not a moron, actually. He's one of the smarter economists of the bourgeois class that came after Marx. Um, one of the founders of neoclassical economics, which was needed because um, Marx so thoroughly refuted and, and brought to a conclusion classical economics. Um, so he basically had to invent this idea that socialism is impossible. Um, and the only thing we can do in economics is um, understand how capitalism works and try and get it to work better um, by maximizing people's profits and maximizing the profits of the corporate class. He's a perfect example of a mouthpiece for the, the ruling class in academia. Um, whether with his theory of the ECP um, or with his, you know, any of his, any of neoclassical economics ideas, um, which essentially account to price astrology, you know, just looking at the price right now and, and you know, trying to explain, you know, how prices work, um, how they're related to supply and demand um, uh, without ever criticizing the system or the structure of the system. 
or how labor is exploited, blah, blah, blah. Well, I think here we go. I got some longer, longer uh, responses here about Lysenko. And I mean, I don't know what I was expecting from the chat. Like, um, it's not like the average person just reads a bunch of Lysenko um, or understands evolutionary biology even and keeps up with it um, to the point where they can, you know, let me know if it's correct or not in a Twitch chat. But um, hopefully we have some insights here. I got to go get some water soon too. Jeez. My <laughs> mouth is getting dry. Lysenko was correct in the same way alchemists were. In premise, fundamentally, like we know we can convert matter to matter as alchemy surmised was possible, but it requires immense energy. Hmm. So he was correct in premise, but not in practice, you're saying? So like he was correct in premise that we can alter the environment um, of a species or say a seed a plant species in order to change it quantitatively and qualitatively. But in practice, maybe it didn't work, right? Maybe he tried to um, change, change this uh, seed or this species to, you know, grow enough food for the Ukrainian people and it wasn't successful. Um, so people use that to dismiss his premise, but in fact, he was right. Um, I'm not sure if that's what exactly what you're saying, but very interesting. Either way, virgin capitalist biology versus Chad Soviet biology. Darn right. <laughs> I don't see what the real difference is between the last one and Darwinian evolutionary theory. It seems like semantics. Both are essentially saying the same thing. Darwinian theory says that the changes that happen are internal. They're internal exclusively. So you get, I, I had this in my notes. I forgot to say it. Um, if you have, a genetic mutation, it happens randomly, right? These, these happen randomly internally within the species. And then if that mutation happens to be randomly something that helps that species thrive in its environment, then the species who have that genetic mutation, which occurred internally, will reproduce more than the others um, or the other, you know, uh, the others in their species, and then will eventually become dominant. Right. And so slowly, slowly over time, you have survival of the fittest. Right. You have these genetic mutations that occur internally within the species, um, which lead to more reproduction of that kind of, of being um, because they're better suited to adapt within the to their environment. Um, Lamarckism and Lysenkoism say that species themselves adapt to external stimuli. Right. Stimuli from the environment. Um, so species and organisms themselves can change. The genome collects information from the environment around it and changes, creates mutations that are not just internal, you know, but are a combination of internal and external environmental factors. So rather than just in isolated internal change, you have external, the external is acting on the internal and both are contributing to change. Um, and then, you know, after species have changed, then they pass those mutations down to their um, their offspring that they reproduce. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, or it's a great, um, I'm glad you brought this up. So the neo-Darwinian theory is, is more exclusively internal change um, versus, uh, it, as far as I understand it anyways, and Lysenkoism is more about um, the external stimuli the external environment changing the subject, the species. Um, the species adapts, the genome adapts actively um, to the environment, not randomly, right? Darwinianism is these mutations are random. Lamarckism and uh, Lysenkoism say, no, they're not random. The species, you know, the genome itself adapts based on what's best for survival. And this person answered that for me. Thank you. Darwin equals internal genetics. Phenotype is the absolute determinant. Lamarck and Lysenko um, equal external input ought to contribute to genetic variation and heredity. Exactly. Look at us working together, Galesha. <laughs> we know the Holodomor was a myth because Stalin would never need a spoon. Exactly. He only ate with his hands. Darwin and Mendel were closer in terms of molecular biology later discovered, but the likes of Lysenko and Lamarck intuitively understood what were now known to be epigenetics and ought to exist. Hmm. 
Interesting. Closer in terms of the molecular biology later discovered. Got you. Um, so Darwin and Mendel were closer when it came to understanding the molecular makeup, the biology of the species, the internal. Um, but Lysenko and Lamarck intuitively understood what's now known to be epigenetics. What does epigenetics mean? Um, they understood the external has a plays a role. The environment changes the internal. So. Ooh, got a super chat. Molly McGuire, happy I caught a live. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Really appreciate the 10 bucks. Thank you for your support. Um, we've gotten two super chats while I've been talking about Lysenko and evolutionary biology and genetics, um, which is something that's not normal for this channel. You know, it's a little bit of a reach. Um, so I'm glad people are enjoying it, still sending super chats and stuff. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate that. Thank you. All I know about Lysenkoism is that Wikipedia page. Well, that's a lot of what people know about everything. You'd be surprised how many people like really think Wikipedia is a pretty solid source. It's like, it's so not. It's like, there's a reason your professors tell you not to use Wikipedia. Um, it was a, uh, Caitlin Johnstone did an article about it. I thought. I thought she did an article about um, the ties between Wikipedia and the um, like military industrial complex and stuff. Maybe I'm stupid. <laughs> Whatever. Can't find it. That's all right. Not important. Um, the academic bias against socialism is so obvious, LMAO. And here in the UK, where we study socialism and A-level politics, we're taught that socialism equals social democracy, and Lenin isn't even mentioned in the revolutionary socialist part. That's hilarious. And it's not just socialism itself that's distorted, um, but the academy, like, throws out and completely dismisses, like, the ideas of Lysenko, right, or ideas that could challenge, you know, preconceived bourgeois capitalist ideas, um, you know, psychology is just looking at how individuals react, how do different individuals, you know, act um, within capitalism, you know, with very little analysis. I mean, now there's more, um, but it's it's rarely used to question capitalism and say we need socialism. But um, there's very little analysis of how the psychology of people is changed based on changes in the mode of production, based on changes in the environment, based on changes in the material base. And you see the same thing with evolutionary biology and genetics, like we've been talking about. There's very little discussion of how external stimuli lead to the adaptation and changing of species, you know, and how they lead to qualitative differences between species. Um, it's all very isolated and internal and undialectical. Um, so that's why China is advancing so much faster than us in every field. That's how the Soviet Union was basically kept up with and, and began to surpass um, the U.S. and the West in their very, very, very early years. Like Lysenko was like in the 1930s, late 1930s, early 1940s was when he was doing all this, which, you know, just in 1917, the Soviet Union or, or Russia and, and Ukraine in these areas were agrarian peasant societies, right? They were feudal monarchies without, you know, uh, an educated populace at all are very much investment in education and research and things like this and science. Um, and they were able to, within a matter of years, you know, understand what the West had already discovered um, and make advances on it and make critiques of it because uh, they didn't have the bourgeoisie being a fetter on scientific advancement and investigation, which is, it's, if you're an academic, isn't that not such a motivation to get rid of capitalism, right? So that we can really start researching and understanding the world around us, like really answer these questions um, that we haven't been able to answer forever um, because true science is suppressed by the bourgeoisie. Not that we need to just organize a bunch of academics. It's about the working class, but still. 
Our teachers and professors telling us how untrustworthy Wikipedia is was the truest thing we were taught. You might be right there. You might be right. There's a communist version of Wikipedia called Prol Wiki. Yeah, I love the Prol Wiki guys. We we're friends with them, kind of. Um, I mean, we are. Uh, um, I haven't seen them in the chat in a while, but uh, yeah, check out Prol Wiki. They're definitely a lot better. Um, not that they're perfect, but here's the Midwestern Marks Prol Wiki page. Midwestern Marks U.S. based socialist educational online publishing house. Their content includes online articles, book series, and academic journals. Pretty accurate in online videos. Six members, 20 writers, three Spanish to English translators, 10 writers in the youth league. That's about right. We also have two or three graphic designers. Um, I believe this is all our current writers. I mean, current editors. Um, censorship, they were banned. So. Yeah, it's not super thorough, but I wonder if I could go in here and edit this. I'm going to try and do that later. Um, yeah. So, yeah, check out ProWiki. The guys who run it are cool. Or the people who run it. I don't know if it's guys or girls or whatever. Uh, if only they taught us how it's controlled by spooks, we would have become more woke early. Yeah, true. True that. A friend of mine mentioned that due to the amount of preservatives in food, our bodies are actually degrading at a slower rate. Is that relevant? <laughs> That's interesting. I believe it. You are what you eat, right? I've been really, really trying to lay off preservatives and sugar lately. I've massively, massively cut down the amount of sugar I eat because, you know, I work out so hard um, and it's not always easy to get multiple meals a day. And when you're doing that, I just don't get hungry when I work out and I don't want to eat before I work out because I'll feel sick. Um, so I tend to kind of gorge and binge and then eat a lot of sugar, um, or just eat sugar for like quick energy, but it leads to inflammation, you know, it leads to acne and, you know, superficial, uh, side effects basically. Um, it's just terrible for your health. Um, so I've been trying to lay off, uh, but I had something else to say about that, but I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah. And like, in Western diets, I, I take magnesium every day because something like 50% of Americans are magnesium deficient because of all the preservatives in our diets. And, you know, magnesium helps you stay regulated with your bowels. It helps you poop, um, which uh, constipation, this is a little awkward, but it leads to a ton of anxiety, right? Magnesium deficiency leads to anxiety and depression. So 50% of Americans are magnesium deficient because of what we're eating. And if you're not taking magnesium start, um, it's honest to God changed my life and changed the life of a few of my friends who I've um, put on magnesium and who, you know, and the buddy who told me to start taking it, um, who is a, um, a biologist actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, 50% of the country. And then, you know, we're dosing people with pills and, uh, or pharmaceuticals and things like that um, for generalized anxiety disorder and, and other things when there's natural things we could do like changing our diet or just taking a vitamin. There's criticism of capitalism and Canadian education, but only internal criticism. Okay, we just need to tinker with capitalism, not enough serious discussion of alternatives. Absolutely. Same with the healthcare administration, the field that I'm in for sure. Wikipedia still lists James Earl Ray as MLK's murder. Someone go change that to the FBI, would you? <laughs> B12 deficiency can cause that as well. I've been dealing with since October. Well, I'm glad you're you're um, finding a supplement routine that helps, Jimmy. Um, I also have B12 in my um, vitamin chest. I did a TikTok a while laying out everything I take. It's like vitamin C and magnesium daily. Uh, gotta have it. Um, but then I also have B12 for when I don't have energy um, and when I want to digest my food. Um, I have fish oil. I, I take that pretty close to daily, too. Uh, I have some nootropics uh, for cognitive function. That's not necessary, but it's nice. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. But if you eat healthy and you get, you know, a lot of vegetables, a lot of these vitamins you're just going to get naturally. I'm not deficient, but I've been taking B12 for it. Good. Try some magnesium if that helps. What's the deal with the opponents of Lysenko being arrested? It's just not really true. 
right? It's just not, it's, I mean, there are examples of it. And like I said, I'm, I'm just getting into this research, but there's so much, there was so much suppression, especially during Lysenko's time and especially in Britain, in the UK, you know, where capitalism was uh, the, a real hot commodity and had fully developed first, um, which is what Marx was looking at writing capital. Um, there was so much suppression of geneticists to the point where the, uh, you know, professor teaching genetics in the UK, JBS Haldane had to leave. Um, and he said that like by the end of world war one or world war two, there were no geneticists left in the UK. There was nobody even studying this stuff anymore. Um, cause it had been suppressed so bad. And then they turn around and say that, you know, anybody with different ideas in the Soviet union was suppressed. And, um, you look at the, the rich debate that existed in, in Soviet evolutionary biology and Soviet genetics. It's like, what do you, well, who was being suppressed then? Cause there's these different schools of thought that are constantly going at each other. And sometimes they would call for the other one to be suppressed, but usually it was shut down. Um, and maybe I just haven't gotten far enough in the history. I, I think wasn't Lamarck eventually arrested or something. So that's something I need to research, but I'm coming back. I've come back to thank you for helping me explore communism as a sprouting Marxist two years ago. Wow. Thank you, Grace. Thank you so much for the $10 super chat. Third super chat we've gotten. Um, Y'all are killing it today with that. Thank you um, for supporting the project. No need to thank me. Um, I'm glad. It makes me so happy when I hear that I've helped people in their journey. Um, their journey to either become a Marxist or, or develop themselves and their understanding of Marxism. Um, so really, really appreciate that. And it's great to see, um, people who are farther along in their journey, you know, cause we've been doing this work for like years now, like two and a half, three years. So there's a lot of people who've been following us from forever ago when I, I knew a infantile fraction of what I know now about Marxism and stuff. Um, so yeah, really cool to see. Thank you for the super chat. <laughs> All right, we got to get to this Vush video. Otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna have to split it into two parts, honestly, because, um, because I have to go to practice eventually. Usual. There were to be now some kind of. Um, but this is Vush, Vouch, Vush, the Vush pit reacting to um, Zizek who Vush loves. It's one of his inspirations, which should tell you something about Zizek. If you're still defending Zizek that he, you know, spawned Vush. Um, but they did this video talking about Yugoslavia and how everything NATO did in U Yugoslavia was pretty good um, and how they needed to bomb Yugoslavia and how leftists who don't support the bombing of Yugoslavia, like Parenti, you know, they're just wrong. Um, and of course, they give very little evidence for this, very li little material analysis. And, and when they do, they leave out a lot of the important facts, um, facts that are pretty much all listed in Michael Parenti's To Kill a Nation, the attack on Yugoslavia. Um, so we're, we're going to debunk a lot of that today. Um, but I'm going to go grab my water while I play this. Um, I've seen the video already. So um, I'll let you all start watching it and then I'll be back. Here, this is Zizek in 2009, commenting on the NATO bombings in Serbia and other interventions. This may surprise you. I'm differentiated here. That is to say, to the horror of many of my leftist friends, I supported uh, NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. He's a good dude. Oh my God, I love him so goddamn much. Holy shit. Because I think, uh, and I said something for which some people were calling. I, I can't believe, dude, lefties should just never talk about foreign policy ever. If you're a leftist and you have an opinion on foreign policy, you should just shut up. Okay, go apple bobbing. Just do anything else. Um, because, like, I heard about the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia as some kind of, like, monstrous Western intervention. And the more I read about it, the more justified it was. It was like, oh, they were doing an ethnic cleansing, millions of people being kicked out of the country. Oh, they were indiscriminately shelling the countryside and doing mass ex executions, and there were mass graves around. Oh, there were multiple attempts to reason with Serbia beforehand and try to get them to withdraw or to get them to, like, 
submit to an intervention from the UN with uh, with with inspections, and their only prerequisite was that they withdraw their troops from the uh, occupied like two B uh, Kosovo areas. A couple, like I think, around like maybe a thousand people died from the like civilians died from the bombings, but there were already tens of thousands of deaths from the genocide, with many more piling up like every single day. And they were doing everything in their power to avoid like having to stop. And all the Serbians, dude, the Serbian government was literally like drinking blood. They were insane. It, this was not like some like half and half back and forth conflict or whatever. The Serbian government was like was like frothing at the mouth to slaughter and um and Albanians. It was insane. Um, citation needed. Citation needed that everyone in the Serbian government was frothing at the mouth to kill Albanians because they were just so crazed. <laughs> Vaush's arguments are always so abstract, idealist, made up. They totally go along with this U.S. State Department idea that some some countries and some people are just evil. You know, in the West, we have freedom and democracy because we're great. But, you know, other governments are just vicious and they love killing people for the sake of killing people. They don't even have their own interests. They just want to murder people for fun. Um, and then <laughs> the the thing you said, uh, the thing you said that made me want to react to this video. It's so ridiculous. The more I learn about this conflict, the more I learn how effing justified it was. Like you're a psychopath. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the details yet. I'll save that for later and, and let the video play out a bit. But my copy of To Kill a Nation. Um, no, uh, my copy of Black Shirts and Reds is signed by Parenti. Um, but my copy of To Kill a Nation was sent to me by Michael Parenti himself. Um, and my copy of Black Shirts and Reds came with a note and was signed by him. So just had to flex that real quick. Same. It was certainly more justified than they did in places like Iraq or Afghanistan. No, dude, they're not even comparable. They're not even comparable, not even remotely. The NATO intervention in, U in Yugoslavia is completely incomparable to the Iraq invasion. They're not even on the same wavelength. They're so, it's so different. Do you guys remember the debate that I had with that pro-Serbia guy who was like... <sighs> Sorry, that was the other thing that he said that's so ridiculous. Leftists shouldn't even care about foreign policy. Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, what's that? Which is hilarious because Vouch claims to be a Marxist, right? And he claims to have a Marxist understanding, a dialectical materialist understanding of, of capitalism, which is a global system, which, you know, the Marxist understanding of capitalism is that it is imperialism, right? It, it functions based on the ex super exploitation of, of countries in the global south and, you know, um, not just because they're based in the global south, but because they're exploited by Western uh, multinationals. He's like, we shouldn't even talk about foreign policy. And then, as this person says, proceeds to give the worst foreign policy takes of all time. <laughs> like, no, Vush, you shouldn't talk about foreign policy. Like basically pro the mass slaughter of Albania. Because like every question that I would ask, it would be like, oh, yeah, haha, well, maybe this shouldn't have happened. You know, I felt like I was talking to a Holocaust denier. Jesus. Sounds like Serbia was doing a Nazi Germany 2.0. Oh, the Serbs are all Nazis. Every one of them. Right. I said, maybe we need more interventions. Sorry, last time I'll pause it. Was that a joke? When he said that all the Serbs are Nazis? Was he, was he being sarcastic? I couldn't tell. Because with what he said about how they were just frothing at the mouth to kill Albanians, like, he probably does believe that they were all ethno-nationalists. You know, there's no Nazis in Ukraine, though. They're all freedom fighters who love liberal democracy, just like Bush. But the right ones, for example, take Congo today. It's such an absolute nightmare. Five million people died in the last 10 years for an actual... I would, I would, I would, uh, unironically, I would totally be in favor of Western intervention in the Congo because I don't actually think it could get any worse. Is that I think we've reached that point. The cool thing about the Congo is that I don't actually think it's possible for things to get worse. So the intervention can only make things better, right? It's so over there yeah i would say even if the devil comes just to break this but typically the united states will not intervene there because nobody cares about congo no? and so on so i would say that uh, my dad served with doctors without borders in kosovo he described untold horrors committed by the serbs there's so much undocumented even today yeah like even from the brief research you guys don't understand man okay the serbian government had their military and police forces literally establishing artillery positions to fire over mountainsides to shell the civilian areas of he admits that he didn't do that much research. He probably just glanced at the Wikipedia page and was like, wow, these Serbs are evil. And then he's like, you guys don't understand, man. You guys don't understand, man. He literally says that. <laughs> like the Serbs are so evil. Even from the brief research I did by reading the Wikipedia page, like 
you know, you don't understand. You can't understand a topic fully if you've only done, you know, brief surface level research. <laughs> Read this book, please. All right, I'll get into the substance of his argument soon, I promise. Mostly ethnically Albanian people in their own territory. Like they were they were establishing like military fronts for civilian executions. It was insane. One has to make a concrete decision every time. My general rule would be, why not? Yugoslav, that intervention, uh, Afghanistan, so-so, more yes than no, uh, Iraq, and we will see. But basically, I think it was a catastrophe in another sense, even if they will succeed in Iraq. Knowingly or, or unknowingly, and a good politician should know this, should think about this. What de facto happened is that they isolated much more than before United States and the Western idea in general among Arab countries. How hated is now Western liberalism there? This is why my joke about United States. Wait, somebody in YouTube chat asked, is Vasha hot? I think this is one of the big failings of leftist foreign policy, is that they're incapable of distinguishing between being pro-intervention and pro-invasion. To the leftist, there is no, like, to, there, there is no difference between being pro-war and thinking that there are things your country can do abroad, you know? Like, there is, there's no blurry line there. It's, it's just like any time you do anything outside of your own country, it's, it's war. Unless it's Russia, of course, in which case they're defending themselves against NATO aggression by blah, 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 blah. You know, um, but yeah, no, I, I, there is absolutely a place for humane intervention. And I know that because I've seen humane intervention happen. We all have, even if some lefties fail to recognize it. The problem is that, like, systemically, America isn't really incentivized to do humane intervention because America can sucks. The problem is, it's like, there, there are avenues for good behavior here, but America doesn't really have the, like, incentive structure to do those things, you know? So if America doesn't have the incentive structure to do good things and do humane intervention, why do you think the intervention and the bombing of Yugoslavia was good? You don't think it was about capital expansion? You don't think it was about implementing austerity and allowing Western multinationals to control Yugoslavia or stopping their market socialism from being a competitor with Western firms? Of course, they weren't acting in a humanitarian way. And he admits that he understands this. He's like, you know, America just doesn't have the incentive to do, you know, humane interventions because they're all about capital expansion. Um, but when they carpet bombed this country um, and destroyed them and uh, left toxic chemicals in their soil and hit their power plants and their infrastructure and killed civilians, um, that was that was humanitarian. What the hell are you talking about? And I didn't even mention they backed the KLA. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Little more of little more of Vush than we're done. So, so, so how do you push for those like good things? Well, I would say that our military support of Ukraine is without question one of the best foreign policy decisions and one of the most ethically justifiable that we've made in the past century. Certainly one of the best that we've made since World War II. It's very unambiguous. We're giving military support to a liberal democracy defending itself from a fascist invasion. It's very straightforwardly a good thing, despite what some lefties might say. That's not interesting. There may there is an argument to be made that there was a humanitarian intervention in Ukraine, but not by the U.S. Intervention, of course, uh, you know, selling weapons to countries that you're allied with. If that was intervention, then every country would always be intervening in every other country's conflicts. And that seems like kind of a broad definition, but big news. Exactly. Bill Clinton was No, Bill Clinton was not based. The only reason that NATO intervened with the whole Yugoslavia thing is because they didn't want a refugee crisis of dirty Slavs. And also because Serbia is basically just miniature Russia. And we want to, we want to, we want to keep the post-Cold War geopolitical relationship clear with the Russia sphere. It wasn't because they cared about the genocide of people. There's a Bill Clinton statue in Kosovo. Really? That's funny. Actually, not a bad one. That is very recognizably Bill Clinton. And then to help you out, it says Bill Clinton at the bottom right there. So that's cool. Here's Hillary Clinton, the less likable of the two visiting. Yeah, I can't blame the uh, the, the, the Kosovars or whatever. Liking Bill Clinton, considering he had the... Uh, you know, he had a heavy hand in stopping a genocide of their people. It is that if there were to be now some kind of a new Stalinist government in United States, the first thing to be would be to arrest George Bush and put him to trial as a traitor and friend of uh, fundamentalists. Because what True. he effectively did is he undermined all American authority so much in Latin America, in third world, and so on and so on. In a good Stalin situation, he should have confessed that he is a traitor and demanded to be shot or whatever. No, I really think, you see, that's the problem. I know. But see, this is exactly the kind of leftism that I'm talking about, you know? For the crimes that Bush has done in Latin America, he should be tried and shot. And additionally, uh, more NATO, more NATO intervention abroad. You see, for every for every NATO intervention that we do, 
we should take one former war criminal president and shoot them. Uh, only by achieving this balance can we... <laughs> oh, and I know what Michnik and Havel wanted to say when they say, whatever you say, what bad thing is there to overthrow a tyrant? Like Saddam Hussein. Yes, but the effect on the entire region of global situation was catastrophic. And there is another irony. If you look at Iraq today, it is still undecided what will happen. I mean, you know that under Saddam, it was nightmare terror, but Saddam's regime was one of the most secular ones, except for the last two years. So paradoxically, the first, they said, we come there to bring human rights, women's freedom. But wait a minute, the first result till now was that uh, religious fundamentalism grew incredibly more strong. I spoke with some Iranians who told me, wonderful, the United States did the job for us. They got rid of Saddam. It is, it is so incredible. Yeah, the U.S. created ISIS. Um, so they led to a rise in religious fundamentalism, which they said they went there to fight. But we all know the Iraq war was bad. Everybody's an anti-imperialist in hindsight. You know, everybody can, can point back and say that um, the Iraq war, Afghanistan war were bad um, based on lies. But one of the exceptions to that rule, and that thing I always say that everybody's an anti-imperialist in hindsight, is the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia and the NATO bombings. Like those... For whatever reason, there's still a lot of people who who will you know die on that hill. People who call themselves leftists or socialists, um, and it is completely ridiculous. Um, as I'm about to explain, so I'll go through and, and debunk everything that they said there. I've got like seven pages of notes on this, but first I want to read a passage from Michael Parenti's "To Kill a Nation: The Attack on Yugoslavia," which, like I said, uh, Parenti sent me with the help of his son Christian Parenti. Um, and with the help of our buddy Andy, who's been on the show before. Um, so shout out to them for that. But one of the, the quotes I really liked in that was, despite their high sounding proclamations, U.S. and other Western leaders treated Yugoslavia exactly the way they have treated many other people around the world, all over the world. Sorry. Nevertheless, green and left intellectuals and various liberals convinced themselves that this time their leaders were indeed acting as champions against genocide. Since NATO's war against Yugoslavia was indisputably illegal, it had to be justified on higher humanitarian grounds. It was a moral crusade to stop the greatest of all evils, Milosevic and the genocidal Serbs. So everything Parenti said um, about what the green and left and liberal intellectuals were using to justify the carpet bombing of Serbia and Yugoslavia and the U.S.'s years of intervention via IMF, World Bank infiltration, and the funding of terrorist groups like the Kosovo Liberation Army was what Vaush just said. You know, it's exactly what he said. And he even admits, you know, the U.S. didn't have the incentive to go in there for humanitarian reasons, um, but, but the bombings just happened to be humanitarian. And the funneling of arms and weapons to the Kosovo Liberation Army, this anti-Serbian terrorist group, that was justified because the Serbs were worth and worse and they were just frothing at the mouth and so angry. Uh, trust me, I started doing research on this uh, earlier today. Um, so Parenti's book is evergreen, ever useful, um, still explains today these contemporary intellectuals like Zizek and Vush um, defending this horrific intervention, which was totally illegal and never justified. Let's get educated, team. Leg day with Eddie in my ears. Heck yeah. That's freaking cool that you're lifting while listening to the stream. Get after it, comrade. You're going to be huge. Thank you so much for the $20 to Frick Frack. Frick Frack's always supporting the stream, always sending huge, huge super chats and donations. So really appreciate it. Much love, comrade, as always. And sometimes I think Vouch is like joking, right? Like, could anyone actually be this stupid? Um, do we get to the part where he talks about Afghanistan yet? Um, where is it? He talks about Afghanistan at one point and Zizek says basically like, um, Iraq was bad. Afghanistan was okay. And the intervention in Yugoslavia was good. You know, that's how he puts it on his scale. It's like, no, they were all horrible. They were all, you know, interventions for capitalist expansion. You know, none of the intended results were actually what happened. You know, it made the situation chaos in all of these countries made, you know, and Afghanistan was supposed to also um, fight religious extremism, which it, you know, greatly increased. Um, and, and they want to say that some of these interventions were a gray area and some were even good. 
Um, I'm going to play one little part of the video because I, I want to talk about their Afghanistan point. Horrible, cynical uh, Talleyrand wisdom, you know, Napoleon's foreign minister, eternal survivor, when he said once, this is not only a crime, it's much worse, it's a mistake. You know? <laughs> this is what I'm afraid about the bombing of Iraq and so on. But again, I don't have this great left cliches, which are American intervention, always a crime. No, it's not as simple as that. Let's see, here and there. I'm only claiming that quite pragmatically what they got. I fucking love him. Oh, yeah, look up Afghanistan's population. He says, American intervention isn't always a crime. And Vouch is like, God, I love him. <laughs> no, capitalist imperialist intervention is always for capital expansion. And if you're socialist, you should always be against that. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a crime within the capitalist bourgeois legal system. But from the point of view of the working class who always suffers from these interventions and pays the bill for them, they are always terrible, which is why Lenin wrote his book, Imperialism, which these two should should read. Ah, uh, yes, you know, the uh, you know, the Soviet joke, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan commences and the uh, the Politburo uh, decide they're going to initiate a five year plan to reduce the number of starving people in Afghanistan. And by the mid 80s, comrades, Great news. There are fewer starving people in Afghanistan and fewer people in general. Seriously, look at that shit. Just knocked a few, few million off the population. So this is what I mean by sometimes I think Vouch has to be joking. Like there's no way that he could possibly be this stupid. Like, oh, the, the Soviet Union entered Afghanistan at that point And the population went down despite the Soviets' plans for economic development. Therefore, the Soviets killed all those people, right? Correlation equals causation. The Soviets did worse in Afghanistan than the U.S., he says. Uh, he goes on to say, but the reason that the Soviets entered Afghanistan at this time was because there was horrific infighting in Afghanistan, including the mass slaughter of literacy workers who were teaching people to read by U.S.-backed groups like Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen. They were backing all these anti-socialist extremists because there was a progressive socialistic government that came to power after years and years and years of struggle and not only economic but also cultural reform in Afghanistan. And uh, a government finally came to power with, an, with plans for teaching everyone to read, bringing everyone health care, industrializing the country, moving them away from the peasant-based economy. But the U.S. was backing groups who would slaughter literacy workers. Some of the groups would hang out in Pakistan and, and other countries surrounding this, um, Afghanistan who would go over the border and, and massacre literacy workers. And if you want to see a really good video explaining all of this, go to Vijay Prashad's um, video that he's done about the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. It's an interview that he did where he explains this, what led to the intervention. So that government requested the Soviets come help them like 10 times, you know, and the Soviets refused and refused and refused, and they finally did, right? And of course, the U.S. only increased their, um, their greatly increased their involvement in Afghanistan at that time. And portrayed the Soviets as these brutal invaders massacring the Afghani people, you know, even though they had been the, the Afghani government had requested that they come in and help fight these extremist terrorist groups um, being backed by the U.S. and leading to all this civil war and infighting. So, yeah, when all that civil war and infighting was going on, when the U.S. was funneling a bunch of arms and weapons to extremist terrorists, the population dipped. And Vush just wants to say, well, that's when the Soviets got there. So it must have been all them. Do you, like correlation doesn't equal causation is something you learn in like kindergarten, Vush, that you can't just look at a graph and draw, you know, definite conclusions from a graph. You actually have to look at the historical context. and You have to look at what was actually going on. But no, no, it'd be much, much easier to just blame everything bad that happened on the Soviets. Like, it's almost like he's joking. Like it's it's almost beyond parody. Um. So, throughout this interview, Zizek and Vush downplay the NATO's intervention in Yugoslavia um, and the civilian casualties that happened in the bombing specifically. Because remember, the U.S. was involved in Yugoslavia for a long time. 
right? Yugoslavia, I believe it was the 70s when they started accepting IMF and World Bank loans because they had to, um, or they felt like they had to, but then those loans were used to infiltrate them, um, force them to adopt austerity practices, um, force them to um, allow more freedom for Western multinational corporations, um, the same way that, you know, U.S. economic warfare and the IMF and the World Bank always work, always try and dismantle any, you know, socialist elements or um, public elements of, of a system. Um, then in the mid to late 90s was when the U.S. takes the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, off the listing of, of terrorist groups so that they can funnel them a bunch of arms and weapons. Right. And then when that's not quite successful enough, you have the 1999 carpet bombing of Yugoslavia and Serbia, um, which kills a thousand civilians, which, you know, Vouch says was worth it um, because it saved, saved Yugoslavia and saved Serbia and saved Albania and, and Kosovo, which was later created. Um, so while just completely ignoring the role that the U.S. played in, in creating the conflict, in creating the warfare, in cheering on the the ethnic conflict and the um, ethno nationalism and the fighting, like how can you talk about how the Serbs were murderous ethno nationalists while not mentioning the KLA, while not mentioning the fact that the U.S. was funneling arms and weapons into what became the most powerful ethno nationalist extremist group in the region? Yes, there were Serbian nationalists. Yes, they did terrible things, but they got more terrible things. Um, or, I mean, the fighting uh, between different ethnic groups and the um, the arising of Serbian nationalist groups greatly increased when the U.S. started funneling arms and weapons into Albanian nationalist groups and doing everything they could to um, create ethnic conflict in Yugoslavia because they knew it was a melting pot, right? They knew it was a country made up of, of all these different nations. So if they could inflame nationalism and national hatred against the Serbs, like Vouch is doing when he says they were frothing at the mouth and that they were all Nazis, then they could create conflict and warfare and dismantle the socialist state. He's so dumb. <laughs> so like I said, the U.S. had the KLA on a, a list of terrorist groups, but took them off that list to funnel them weapons. Um... And, you know, they, they also always treat this like this was just a minor intervention, right? Like there were just a few bombings. They targeted the Serbian nationalists. You know, a few civilians died, but that's okay. Um, and then, um, you know, a few hundred civilians died, actually thousands. Um, but that's all right. It was totally worth it. And it led to less deaths in the long run. It was not a minor intervention. Like I said, they're ignoring all the intervention that came prior to the bombings. But then in the bombings, NATO carried out 38,000 aerial combat missions in 10 weeks. 38,000 aerial combat missions, planes going and dropping bombs on Serbia, a country in Eastern Europe, in civilian areas, hitting factories and power plants and farms and political headquarters. In 10 weeks, 38,000 of them. And this is from Wikipedia, right? I'm not even reading from Michael Parenti's To Kill a Nation right now. These aren't even stats from Parenti or from independent journalists or from alternative sources. These are from Wikipedia where we know that Vush does all his reading. So even, you know, looking at Western sources, everything here is exaggerated or wrong or shows that he's a chauvinist imperialist who, who doesn't care about the murderous interventions of Western capitalist nations. Um, so let's just continue to look at Wikipedia and other Western sources. So the U.S. during this time fired Tomahawk cruise missiles um, from ships and subs um, in the water, obviously. And what they fired at were called dual-use targets, meaning civilian and military. So what does this mean? You know, when you say that it's a dual use target. It can be anything that has any kind of relation to the military or any kind of military importance, right? So the U.S. can essentially justify dropping bombs on anything. You, you blow up somebody's house. Oh, there was a, a Serbian nationalist in there. It was a dual use target, right? You blow up a factory, which they did. Only state-owned factories, no private or, or U.S.-owned factories, only the ones uh, controlled by the socialist state. Um, they bombed hundreds of them. 
Um, but they label those dual use targets. You know, people can't go back to work then once the U.S. left. They're left unemployed and in a state of poverty. But, oh, well, you know, it, it, the factory had military importance. They were making bullets for the tiny Yugoslav military that had no hope of stopping the U.S. Um, they were destroying power plants because those power the military. Farms because those feed the military. Telecommunications facilities. They do propaganda for the military. And not one but two different Socialist Party headquarters. So not only Milosevic's uh, Socialist Party headquarters, um, who was the leader of Yugoslavia, who was accused of genocide by the U.S. and used to justify this, um, but another Socialist Party headquarters who um, was less supportive of Milosevic, but the U.S. didn't like. So these were all just listed as dual-use targets, even though they're clearly like telecommunications facilities. Are you kidding me? Like news outlets? You think if somebody came and bombed MSNBC in the U.S. and was like, oh, you know, they they support the U.S. military. They the New York Times supported the Iraq war. All the all these Western outlets did They're dual use targets. We're just going to drop bombs on them and, and whoever's in there be damned. You know, whatever civilians in there are in there that it's worth it because they're dual use targets. So you see how this this framing of dual use can be used to justify bombing any any civilian area. Um, and many people at this time uh, criticized this as a violation of the Geneva Convention and international law, this use of dual, or this claim that these were dual use targets. Again, this is from Wikipedia, um, not even from independent media. So even Western people um, who were, or even Western liberals were like, uh, this is a violation of international law and the Geneva Convention. Um, so essentially what they did was bomb the industrial base that served as a competitor on the global market to U.S. firms um, was the main reason that they went into Yugoslavia because they were producing a lot and they had this market socialist system um, much different from the unbridled, unfettered, trickle down neoliberal capitalist system that the U.S. was trying to enact on a global scale. Um, so they were serving as competitors to Western multinationals. So the U.S. just wanted to wipe these all out and basically lay a clean slate for um, Western infiltration, the infiltration by Western corporations, and prevent these, these competitors on the global market, right? Like prevent Yugoslav or Serbian um, steel companies from competing with Western steel companies. Um, so one of these dual targets that they hit included the radio television um, of Serbia headquarters. That was the name of it, radio television of Serbia headquarters. And these bombings killed 16 civilian employees. Uh, so like I said, they just labeled these things factories and, and news outlets, dual use targets. And it's always interesting, like imagine some other country doing this to the U.S. Like imagine Russia or Serbia saying that the U.S. has committed genocide around the world with all their interventions, so we're going to attack dual-use targets there. And then they just bomb the New York Times and MSNBC um, and uh, some, some factories where a bunch of workers are working and just kill all the civilians in there like they did in the radio television of Serbia HQ where they killed 16 people um, and then just shrugged and said, well, there was military importance to that area, so it was worth it. Um, but this, this bombing of the radio television of Serbia HQ triggered an international response. It triggered a response from human rights groups, including Amnesty International, who's usually very pro-Western empire um, in relation to, to other humanitarian groups or what they should be. Even they labeled this a war crime. Right? Even they criticized this as, a, as, um, as against international law as a human rights abuse, um, which they were attacked by State Department outlets and propaganda outlets for doing, for labeling it a war crime, similar um, to how they were attacked when they pointed out that the U.S. was funneling arms and weapons to neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Um, but yeah, everyone, a broken clock is right twice a day. And Amnesty International is a broken clock who every time they're right, they get lambasted by the public and by the media, not by the public, I should say, but by the bourgeois media. Um, so the U.S. also struck a railway bridge with a train that was carrying 20 civilian passengers, and they killed all of them. They, the justification that the military gave, this was an accident because the train was just moving too fast. Sorry. Sorry we killed 20 people and took them away from their families. And 
destroyed the Yugoslav labor or the Serbian and, and Yugoslav labor force by killing um, thousands of people, thousands of workers and their industrial base are bad. The train was moving too fast. How could we have known? Like, I don't know, maybe don't blow up a civilian railway. Um, so there were Albanians being held hostage in Carissa. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a city, um, but they were being held hostage by Yugoslav forces. And they were killed because NATO just bombed them, right? So NATO understood that Albanians, who they claim to be protecting, right? We got to protect the Albanians from genocide by the Serbians. Oh, the Serbians have the Albanians hostage? Just drop a bomb. Just kill them all, right? And that that attack specifically, that bombing specifically, shows that the U.S. didn't care about protecting Albanians, right? It showed that they would do anything... Um, anything to take out the Yugoslav forces and take out Serbia and, and get done what they wanted to get done, which was regime change and destroying the industrial base. Um, but it, and then it also sent a message to the Yugoslav forces, sent a message to Milosevic, like you can take Albanian hostages if you want. We've been lying about how we care about the Albanians. That's just a propaganda tactic. We'll kill as many Albanians as we need to, right? Take as many hostages as you want. We'll bomb them all was was the message that that bombing and Carissa sent to the Yugoslav government. Um, so in, after the bombings, the Yugoslav government said there were $100 billion in damages. Um, some Western economists estimated $30 billion. Um, so obviously you get varied totals there, and it, that's a difficult estimate to make. Um, so how do you put a, an exact monetary value on like human life and the amount of destruction? But, um, so here's some of the statistics, again, from Wikipedia. 25,000 homes, 69 schools, 19 hospitals, 20 health centers, and 176 cultural monuments were destroyed or heavily damaged. This is the humanitarian intervention that Vaush and Zizek were praising and saying, you know, oh, it only killed a few people, but it prevented more bad things from happening. Yeah, the... the <laughs> The same bombings that took out 25,000 homes, 69 schools, 19 hospitals, and the whole country's industrial base. Like even if it only did kill a thousand people, which is a low estimate, and that's still an insane amount of people to just kill, right? By just deciding to start bombing a country. But how many people lost their homes? How many kids lost their schools? How many you know, hospitals were destroyed that prevented people from getting medical care and then led to, led to death. Um, so Wikipedia says that the bombs came because Serbia wouldn't agree to a political settlement that would allow NATO um, free reign to carry out operations in all of Yugoslavia, including Serbia. So, you know, Vaush will say that the U.S. was was proposing a peace deal and Milosevic and the Serbians wouldn't accept it. Like, yeah, the deal was that they would allow NATO to occupy the entire thing, including Serbia. The deal was that they would basically make Yugoslavia a U.S. colony. Like, yeah, no shit they didn't agree to that. Would the U.S. agree if Russia came and said, hey, we're going to start carpet bombing you unless you let our troops go wherever they want and run your government? Is that an, an intervention that would be for the sake of democracy if Russia did that to us? It's insane, but that's what the U.S. always does. They'll make this ridiculous proposal to the other country. Like, hey, let us run your economy and your politics and your military undemocratically for now until the end of time. Otherwise, we're going to carpet bomb you. And then the other country's like, um, no. And the U.S. is like, wow, they're so belligerent. They won't agree to our peace deal. They won't agree to our demands. I mean, I mean, our, our accords. Uh, let's start bombing them. How it goes every time. So Yugoslavia didn't agree because they said it would be a threat to their sovereignty, obviously. Um, and that that part of the agreement was eventually taken out of the final agreement post bombings. Um, and today, Kosovo, um, in former Yugoslavia, because Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore, has more NATO troops stationed there, occupying there than any other place on the planet Earth. Um, so NATO got what they want in a, wanted in a vast majority or not uh, in a large part of the, the area. But like Serbia doesn't allow NATO forces to just run rampant and control their government still. Um, 
So that wasn't eventually carried out, but something very close to it was. And now you have constant conflict in, in the Balkans, um, as it's now known, um, between NATO peacekeepers and, and other groups and whatnot. Um, and there's obviously lingering ethno-nationalist feelings and ethno-nationalist groups since this happened. Um, so eventually they agreed to the creation of Kosovo, which would be administered by NATO um, with no say from the people in that region for three years. Um, and like I said, today, there's more NATO troops there than ever before. So basically just allowing the NATO to, to run this place like a colony um, was what they agreed to. Uh, didn't even give the people autonomy, didn't give the people voting power, didn't give the people any say for the first three years. So this intervention that Zizek and Vaush are hailing as bringing democracy to the Balkans allowed the U.S. Um, or allowed NATO to run this place, run this newly formed country for three years, however they wanted. That's not freedom and democracy, guys. That's called colonialism. Not even like neocolonialism. That's like direct colonialism when NATO directly controls and administrates this area um, and, and uses their military to suppress anybody who tries to stop them. Um, so Vouch says, of course, only a handful of civilians died in the bombings, um, but hundreds of thousands of people were forced to flee their homes. And many people, because the U.S. hit 25,000 homes, didn't have any house to come back to. You know, so he's also ignoring the, the toll that the bombings had on civilians um, from an economic perspective or from a housing perspective or from a healthcare perspective. Um, so most Albanians were allowed to return after a few weeks or months. Um, but most non-Albanians who fled never returned. They were forced to flee to Serbia under threat of ethnic violence because, like I said, there weren't only um, extremist nationalists on the Serbian side. They were also on the Albanian side, like the Kosovo Liberation Army, the KLA, and the U.S. had given them a bunch of arms and weapons and inflamed those tensions and told them to go get those darn Serbians. So the Serbian civilians couldn't return home after the bombings because the Albanian nationalists and the Kosovo nationalists now had the power. They now had the control and they would kill the Serbians if they came back. So they had to leave their homes and leave everything behind forever. You know, but, oh, who cares? Who cares? You know, only a thousand people died, says Vouch from his computer chair in the U.S. Greasy fuck. I, he's like, mm, what a slime ball that guy is. What a slime ball he is for saying this stuff about these people who lost their homes. Um, and, and after this, again, still reading from Western sources and from Wikipedia, Albanian guerrilla activity spread into other parts of Serbia and surrounding countries. Because like I said, the U.S. supported groups like the KLA and gave them a bunch of guns. So this nationalist extremism started spreading um, out of Kosovo and into Serbia when the whole reason that the U.S. said that they were doing this was to stop, you know, um, uh, fighting between different ethnicities, um, fighting between different nationalist groups that had happened in the Bosnian War in the early 90s. So the populations of non-Albanians has been decreasing ever since then, ever since this happened, has been going down. Um, I don't know if that's an updated stat because um, Serbia has had, you know, some form of recovery and they're backed by Russia now. Um, but based on, on Vush's favorite source, Wikipedia. Um, the population's been decreasing ever since. So the Serbs, you know, of course, had war or did do war crimes and had nationalistic groups, but to act like the Albanians didn't is just absurd. And that was the whole NATO um, propaganda playbook. Um, so the economic losses that happened during the bombing, uh, the bombs hurt the Balkans for years after, of course. Their industrial base was destroyed. Thousands of people were rendered homeless. Their labor force was depleted because um, people had just been killed. Their factories had been destroyed. There was very little unemployment, or there was vast unemployment then. Um, so still going from Wikipedia, there's um, here are some of the post-intervention criticisms that they list. Um, the media watchdog Accuracy in Media said that the U.S. inflated Albanian um, by Serb death tolls in order to justify the bombings. So they lied and said that more people were being killed in the Bosnian war or in ethnic conflict than were actually being killed. So the U.S. could carpet bomb the region and make everything way, way worse. Um, journalists said that the bombings accelerated the ethnic conflict, which is, again, the opposite of the stated goal. We've explained how that happens 
um, when you funnel a bunch of arms and weapons into an Albanian terrorist group who are fighting the Serbian in, um, next groups, um, then that's going to increase, you know, the amount of Serbian terrorist or nationalist groups because they're going to want to fight back. Um, so it's like fighting fire with fire. Uh, William, an uh, independent journalist who somehow got listed on Wikipedia. I'm surprised they haven't censored him completely. Um, but he said, oh, shoot, my... My stream deck is glitching out. Sorry, I got to unplug it quick. Two seconds. Okay. Um, so William Blum said the NATO treaty said that the, that NATO member countries can only attack another country or NATO itself can only attack another country if a NATO member country is attacked first. There's never been any evidence that Serbia was going to attack a NATO member country. And of course, they never, never actually did. Um, and there was another Amnesty International report that claimed NATO intentionally hit civilians. Not even, you know, they weren't just collateral damage. It wasn't just an accident. It wasn't like they accidentally hit some civilians while taking out military targets. Um, but they intentionally hit civilians because they knew it would help them to bomb Yugoslavia's factories, power plants, and whatever else. Apparently, Vush has never read this report from Amnesty International, which, like, like I said, is a, usually a very pro-Western group. Vush is detrimental to the actual growing left movement. You would never support a real revolution in the U.S. peaceful otherwise. Absolutely not. I've said that on Twitter before. Like, imagine if a revolution happened in the U.S. Vush would be on Twitch the day it popped off, calling them reactionaries, calling them, you know, uh, probably smear them supporters or something. Um, he would immediately take the side of the bourgeoisie, take the side of the, the dictatorship of capital that is the U.S. government. He would never never cheer on revolution by the workers. Um, Cause every time there's been a revolution by the workers in another country, like in Yugoslavia and NATO comes in and, and just dismantles it and destroys them or the U S or whatever arm of imperialism, Vush sits at his computer chair and goes, yeah, this is for human rights. Thank you very much for the, the super chat, New York Tommy. So that's just Wikipedia and Western sources like Amnesty National. But let's look at some of the statistics that are given in parentheses to kill a nation, which features opposition via independent journalists, investigative journalists, sources outside the West, outside the Western media bubble um, in West Europe and the U.S. and Canada. Um, so the U.S. illegally bypassed the U.N. Security Council because they knew that Russia or China would veto their attempt to bomb Yugoslavia. So you're supposed to get these kind of interventions approved in the Security Council, where there are five countries who have veto power. Uh, it's the UK, US, France, Russia, and China, I believe. Um, in that, um, sorry, I just heard a weird sound. Um, but the US is bypassed the Council, which is you know illegal and against international law, because they knew, of course, Russia or China wouldn't let them just carpet bomb this place. Um, so they bombed. Or they use cluster bombs to hit political headquarters in civilian areas, which is a war crime and against international law. You're not supposed to use cluster bombs, especially not there. They bombed a hospital and a spokesperson for the U.S. military said it wasn't a hospital. But guess what? A bunch of journalists later went and investigated. And not only was it not only was it a hospital contradictory to what the U.S. military said, but it was now filled with dead bodies because there were patients in there. And the U.S. just destroyed them with bombs and said, nope, not a hospital. But again, you know, Vouch, Vouch said only a few civilians died. You know, so this is this is OK. You know, sorry to the people in that hospital, but the, the greasy gamer in his computer chair um, who simps for NATO said this had to happen. Sorry to your families that they lost you for no reason. Um, so NATO also devised this tactic where they would hit targets once wait 15 minutes um, so that rescue and, and healthcare personnel would come in to search for survivors and help people. And then they would hit it again. So NATO would drop one bomb and then another one 15 minutes later to hit anybody who came to help. Um, and this also made it very difficult to count civilian casualties. 
right? Because they couldn't go to the site right away because then more people were going to die. More innocents were going to die. But again, Vouch, oh, only a thousand people died. Well, Vouch, if you actually researched the conflict, you would know that we don't actually know how many people died because the U.S. bombed everybody, not only um, these places, but then everybody who tried to count the civilian casualties or help. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Vouch is stupid. <laughs> I had something else to say. I was somewhere else I was going with that, but uh, I'm trying to rush through these. I got seven more minutes. Um, so the NATO commander, General Wesley Clark, said that the goal of the with uh, bombings of Serbia were to demolish, destroy, devaluate, like I said, the U.S. destroying their competitors on the capitalist global market, devaluing their productive base, um, devaluate, degrade, and ultimately eliminate the essential infrastructure for human rights. For human rights, we got to destroy the farms and the power plants and the water sanitation facilities, the essential infrastructure that allows civilians to survive in this society. We got to blow it all up for human rights and the hospitals too. Don't forget that. Also, attacks by Serbian paramilitaries. So the Serbian nationalist groups or terrorist groups that, like I said, did exist, increased during the bombings and after the bombings. So the ethno-nationalist violence that the U.S. and NATO said they were stopping vastly increased during and after the bombing. Because like I said, duh, of course it did. Of course it did. Of course, more people in Serbia who just had their country destroyed by NATO bombs and by the Kosovo Liberation Army and Albanian nationalists who were handed a bunch of weapons by the U.S., of course, they're going to take up arms and say, we got to fight back against this. You know, and I don't care how extremist we are. You know, we um, just like the U.S. intervention in Iraq created ISIS because it created a bunch of people who hate the U.S. and turned towards uh, fundamentalism and extremism um, in response to the violence and terror that had been imposed upon them. Same thing happened in, in Yugoslavia and Serbia, of course. Of course. But Vouch and Zizek can't recognize this. No, they can't recognize that at all. This, this intervention was good. This intervention was good. This intervention was good. Just keep telling yourself that, you neoliberal stooges. So, um, Parenti has a chapter, a section called NATO Diplomacy, right? How does NATO do diplomacy? And we kind of talked about this because Vouch says that the U.S. gave them every chance to surrender. You know, if they would have just given in to our demands, which, again, were to give NATO full control over the former Republic of Yugoslavia, including all of Serbia, you know, then we wouldn't have had to bomb them. If they would have let us, you know, dominate them as a colonial power, we wouldn't have had to. So NATO lays out these accords. You know, they call them accords and they have demands like this that basically turn the, um, the country into a colony. And then when a nation disagrees, the, the U.S. corporate media labels them as unreasonable, irrational. They didn't agree to our accords. They're unwilling to negotiate. And then we bomb the crap out of them. And then greasy, neoliberal, pro-NATO morons like Vouch get on Twitch years later and say, well, they didn't agree to our accords. We had to bomb them. It was for human rights. Very slimy tactic that NATO's gotten good at. So Vouch also claims that the Serbian government was drinking blood. They were frothing at the mouth to kill people. What Vouch doesn't mention was that Milosevic was exonerated by the International Tribunal at The Hague. Right? So the U.S. carried out these bombings based on the accusation that Milosevic was doing genocide. But after the bombings... The courts at The Hague found that there was actually no evidence that Milosevic had committed genocide during the Bosnian War. The tribunal found unanimously that it is not satisfied that there was sufficient evidence presented in this case to find Slavodan Milosevic agreed with the common plan of the ethnic cleansing of Muslims and Croats from Serbian territory. In fact, the tribunal found the exact opposite to be true. Much like Western media hype around the weapons of mass destruction, lies that led to the U.S. war in Iraq in 2003, Milosevic was called the Butcher of the Balkans in, a, in the trial of the century and was charged with war crimes in the midst of NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia. 
After being arrested in 2001, Milosevic faced a five-year-long trial defending himself and poised to win the case. He died in prison in 2006 amid rumors that he was poisoned. Imagine that. So once, um, potentially, not to be a conspiracy theorist, um, but Milosevic was poisoned in prison, maybe by the U.S. or NATO, um, once he was poised to win his case at The Hague. Um, and have you ever heard this before? One of my uncles, one of my liberal uncles told me the other day, like, they did find Milosevic guilty, right? Nope. They never did. They exonerated him of all charges. And he didn't know that because it was, it was never reported in Western media. The Western media that beat the war drums and cheered on the bombings and called Milosevic a genocidal, murderous dictator to justify the NATO intervention for months and months and years and years when they were proven wrong, when it was found that their reporting that justified mass murder and the destruction of an industrial base was found to be false. Oh, we didn't see that. Nope. Nope. You know, it must have been a sham trial at the Hague, at the International Tribunal, um, dominated by uh, the West. So crazy, crazy. We could talk forever about the role that Western media played in, in you know, accusing Milosevic of genocide, justifying these bombings, um, and then completely ignoring um, the, the actual um, results of the trial, um, which exonerated Milosevic. Um, so, um, they also found the criminal tribunal, um, in that ruling where they said Milosevic couldn't be charged with genocide. They said that, uh, or some of the evidence they brought up was that Milosevic had actually argued against discriminatory, discriminatory policies against minority groups during internal discussions in the Bosnian war, right? So there were discussions within the government of how do we go about doing this? And Milosevic was arguing against the um, ethno-nationalist arguments. He was arguing against the uh, discriminatory extremist arguments um, uh, for targeting um, Croats or Muslims or Albanians. So, like I said, the ruling was never covered by the press. It was only discovered. The ruling itself wasn't even announced publicly. It had to be discovered by a journalist named Andy Wilcox, independent journalist. Um, and yeah, and that's the only reason we know about it today. So shout out to that guy. Um, and also a German foreign policy officer said privately, there was never any evidence of genocide or ethnic cleansing. You know, there was ethnic conflict going on, which, like I said, was largely supported and propped up by the U.S. and um, World Bank uh, and NATO. But there was never any evidence of, um, of intentional genocide by Milosevic and the Serbs. And even, you know, Western military officers, NATO member countries like this German foreign policy, like the German foreign policy office um, admitted this. So when I tell you that Slavoj Žižek and Vauch are neoliberal stooges who will cheer on capitalist imperialism while pretending to be socialists and Marxists, this is exactly what I mean. I don't know how many examples I need to present to y'all, but this is one of the worst ones. This is definitely one of the worst because Vouch is just clapping his hands like a seal for this. <laughs> yes, bomb him, bomb him, bomb him. Stop the genocide. You're cheering on genocide from the comfort of your gaming chair, you bastard. You NATO stooge. So yeah, Vouch sucks. I got to go to wrestling practice. I'm late already, but I finished that video, so I'm pumped. Peace out, everyone. Solidarity. Thanks to the mods. Thanks to the super chatters. Sorry I couldn't read what people said in the chat about the Yugoslavia thing. I totally would um, if I didn't have to go, but I have to go. Much love. Subscribe, like, share, uh, do other stuff.